Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down the Friday, March 22nd slate of college basketball DFS. It is the second day of March Madness with, um, you know, Thursday being day one, in my opinion. I don't really count the first four in that. But either way, we've got 16 quote unquote second round matchups of the NCAA tournament to break down here on this episode. And we're going to tell you what you can expect from each game as well as who you need to be targeting for your DFS lineups. Now I'm recording this on Wednesday night. So DraftKings doesn't have all their contests up for Friday yet because obviously they're putting a lot of attention on Thursday, which is great. Um, but I'm actually going to be um, at the Texas game um, Thursday night. So I'm not going to record Thursday night. So, you know, with DraftKings having the salaries out, I figured, hey, why not go ahead and get the video out Wednesday night? So that way, you know, as Thursday's going on, if you're ready to go ahead and prep for Friday, you can go ahead and give this a watch um, and get ready for the Friday slate. Now, if you want more from me that is not from just this um, episode, um, remember there are a few places you can get that. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike's Money Picks. You can join the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description to that. We've got a lot of smart people in there who play a lot of DFS for a lot of different sports. And the college basketball chat has been jumping. We've had a lot of guys win a lot of money this year from that Discord. I think we have the best free to join Discord in all college basketball DFS. I, I emphasize free to join because there's others out there that are, are paid that I'm not a part of, so I don't know what, what's out there. But you cannot get access to a, a bunch of good, smart people for free that will you know have fun, talk plays with you, and then sweat it out together with you. It's a blast to be a part of. Cannot recommend that enough. And then also, I do write a article to my Patreon every single college basketball DFS slate where I profile my core plays as well as my lineup strategy and attack strategy for each slate. So you know, if you want more than what you get on this episode, or if you want information that's more up to date than what you're going to get in this episode, make sure you check out one of those three places. All right, so that does it for an introduction, y'all. So let's go ahead and dive into game number. Number one here on Friday. All right, so game number one is going to be between Northwestern and Florida Atlantic, a little 8-9 action to, to um, tip off the day. Um, and this one is a pretty interesting matchup, in my opinion. Um, there's a few real interesting ways that I think you can target this game in DFS, though. Um, so Kent Palm has this game projected to finish 74-73 to in favor of FAU. However, what I think Kent Palm is failing to account for is that Northwestern is really coming in this game beaten up, and they're kind of limping into the NCAA tournament. What I mean by that is they've already had Ty Berry, out for the season. And now Matthew Nicholson is out for at least the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. So um, this team is pretty much playing like six guys and they've got a lot of guys who a boatload of minutes. So that makes them really easy to target. At the top, Boot Booey and Brooks Barnheiser are those guys that you can target. They've combined for over a 50% usage rate in the last two games. I think they make for pretty solid plays if you want a game stack, but I don't really see the likelihood of um, one or both of them getting there and hitting value if this game doesn't end up being high scoring. Now, Nate Martinelli and Ryan Langborg are going to play a crap ton of minutes, and, and so I think they're intriguing options for that purpose as well. Again, you know, they're, they're more options in a game stack. I don't think that um, they're priced at a point where they're going to get value if, if this ends up being a rock fight. Now, what's interesting, though, is they've moved Luke Hunger into the starting lineup for Matthew Nicholson, and the minutes have kind of varied in that, but it looks like Chris Collins finally gained some trust with him against Wisconsin. He rolled him out there for 32 minutes and he put up 14 fantasy points, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that is 4X value for a guy who was at $3,400. So I do not mind going to Luke Hunger. Blake Preston is the other big that they will play, and it looked like he was going to be the guy. I mean, you know, he played 25 minutes against Minnesota before the Big Ten tournament, but then once we got to the Big Ten tournament, it was Luke Hunger's time. So I don't really know what to make of it entirely, but Luke Hunger at $3,400 does have a little bit of upside as a punt play. Now on the FAU side, John L. Davis and Vlad Golden have been their two best players down the stretch of the season. Um, they have been 1-2 on the team in usage in the last five games in either order. Um, however, John L. Davis has not really turned it into a whole lot of fantasy success. He's just not getting the same amount of peripheral stats that he's used to for whatever reason. He's still playing a decent amount of minutes. He's still taking a ton of shots, but the peripheral stats have gone down, which is a little concerning. If this game does end up shooting out, then you have to feel like the peripheral stats are going to be there, and he does have legitimate 45 to 50 fantasy point upside if that happens. Vlad Golden is probably my favorite play on FAU on this uh, slate, though, just because Northwestern is so beat up down low. Like, they're just kind of out of big men that to really defend. And, you know, Vlad Golden's a legit seven-footer that if you give it to him down in the post, he's going to score. You know, you look at the last three games he's played, he's taken 12 shots in each game, and he's made 10, 7, and 9 shots in those games. So um, definitely a guy that I really like the upside for Vlad Golden. I really like the matchup for Vlad Golden. And at $8,000, he, he is at a salary where he's at 4X value in each of the last three games. He's been over 40 fantasy points, which would be 5X value in three of the last five games. So Vlad Gold, really good spot in my opinion. Love the minutes, love the usage, love the matchup. 
Now, after that, Elijah Martin is kind of like the um, – the forgotten one here on this team recently, but he does have a ton of upside. You know, in two of his last five games, he's been over 35 fantasy points. He tends to have more up and down success, whereas Golden and Davis tend to be a little bit more consistent. So do not discount the upside of, of Elijah Martin here on this slate. But after that, it's really like, it's just really random. Between Weatherspoon, Boyd, Gaffney, and Greenlee, you never really know which one of the supporting guards is going to go off. There's no real rhyme or reason for it. There's there's no real any way of predicting it, in my opinion. And um, I just, I don't know, I'm kind of done targeting. I think they're all priced for their ceiling, but they're all not likely to hit their ceiling. Like, you can't just, like, play FAU guard and hope and, and get credit for the one that does well. So um, I'm not not a favorite, not a fan of playing those four guys here in this slate. Giancarlo Rosado. Rosado and Brendan Laurie are um, the backup bigs, uh, but they're kind of split in minutes, which are, are getting less and less because Vlad Golden is playing more and more. So I don't really think they're interesting either. So my, my way of targeting this FAU team would definitely be at the top. Next up, we have Colgate taking on Baylor. Um, the the fighting toothpastes, Colgate. Um, they are projected to lose this game, seventy seven to sixty four, according to Ken Palm. Um, now this is a, a different Colgate team than what you've seen in years past, though, because Colgate's been in the NCAA tournament for quite a few times now. Um, they rank two hundred fifty third in the nation in tempo, and they are actually close to being a top one hundred defensive team, which has not been the case to, for Colgates of years past, who will look to get up and down and score, 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 as opposed to you know get stop, stop, stops. Um, Baylor ranks 281st in tempo. So on paper, this may seem like it should be a really good offensive matchup, but you know, these two teams are not playing at the same pace that they normally have over the past five years. And it makes it a slightly worse game environment to target, especially considering Colgate plays a ton of guys. But what you see consistently though, is that Braden Smith and Ryan Moffat are the only two who play 26 minutes or more in, in pretty much every game. Braden Smith is also their best player. He is their usage leader. He has a 27% usage rate on the season. I think he is at a very affordable price tag at $6,900 because he has hit 4X value for that price, actually 5X value for that price tag in three straight games. Um, and so I definitely think that Braden Smith is a guy who can get you value at $6,900. And we already mentioned Moffat. He's only 5,400. Um, he has been really up and down in terms of fantasy scoring, though. But you know he's a guy that's going to be on the floor and does have a little bit of upside for that reason. Keegan Records and Jeff Woodward are both very high usage players. But the problem is that they split minutes at the five. And so one of them cuts into upside of the other. If I would definitely not recommend playing both of them in the same lineup. Um, I do think you can play one or the other. But it's not exactly a great situation when you know that the minutes are only going to be like so sp- Split. Like you're not going to end up in a situation where one of them plays 30 and the other plays eight, unless there's just like some serious foul trouble from the one that plays eight. Now, the other two guys who play a lot are um, Cox and Cummins, um, and they're very affordable, but they're not really like huge, consistent fantasy guys. I mean, they do have legitimate ceilings. Jalen Cox had 37 fantasy points against Bucknell um, in their conference tournament. And then um, Brady Cummins um, had, did have 26 fantasy points in their um, most recent game against Lehigh in, in their conference title game. So um, these are guys that have upside, but there's no real rhyme or reason to it. But they do play a decent amount of minutes. And so if you're playing enough lineups, they probably should make your player pool at some point. Now on the Baylor side, I think that Baylor is going to have a definite athleticism advantage over Colgate. You know, we mentioned that this is Colgate's fourth in, fourth straight NCAA tournament. Well, they've given up 80 plus points in two of the last three NCAA tournaments that they have made. So the, the signs are pointing to Baylor being able to score a lot of points against this Colgate team. Now, if they do, it's because of their three point shooting. Um, Baylor is the sixth best three-point shooting team in the nation on a percentage basis. However, Colgate is very good at defending the three. They, they rank 11th in three-point defense. So this is kind of a matchup of strength on strength when, when Baylor has the ball. Um, but I, I think that Baylor is just going to have an athleticism advantage in this game. Jalen Bridges and Jacoby Walter are both really good athletes, and they're both going to be able to kind of, I think, have their way with whatever they want against the Colgate defense. And they're the two guys that are going to take the most threes. So if you don't trust the Colgate three-point defense, then those two would be the ones shooting it. And then and Ray J. Dennis is like the ultimate game stacking play. Um, he ranks 12th in the nation in assist rate. So when his team is scoring a lot of points, he is going to get a lot of fancy points. Um, you know, even against Iowa State, where they were held to 62 points, he was able to put up seven points and 11 assists and get to 31 fancy points without really doing a whole lot offensively from a scoring basis. So um, I definitely like the upside of Ray J. Dennis at $7,200 here on this slate. Also, um, if you do get a blowout in this game, um, Ojan Wuna and Miro Little would probably be the guys who would benefit the most from a blowout, but I don't really think that that's necessarily a great, this is a great team to target a blowout for. 
Now, game number three is going to be UAB taking on San Diego State, and Ken Palm has this one projected to be 76-67 to 67 in favor of San Diego State. Now, this is a definite contrast of styles, though. UAB likes to get up and down. San Diego State does not. The good news with UAB, though, is even though you're going up against a slow, great defensive team in San Diego State, their usage and, and their minutes are really concentrated in the conference, or not conference, USA, in the American Athletic title game. They played essentially a six-man rotation. Only six guys played double-digit minutes. And um, it was the starting five of Gaines, Vasquez, Johnson, Lendeborg, and Coleman, with Jamie and Davis playing off the bench, and then Daniel Ortiz playing sparingly. Um, and in those six guys that played, Lendeborg, Gaines, and Vasquez all had over a 20% usage rate. In fact, they've all been the only ones on the team over a 20% usage rate in two straight games. Um, and so you know that that's where the offense is going to come from. But with Lendeborg being so expensive, I know he's been really great but it's just a tough matchup to get behind a guy at $9,200. I would think Gaines would be much more likely to have success given that he's going to be attacking from the perimeter, and I think it's much less likely that he gets in foul trouble. Lindeborg and Christian Coleman could find themselves in foul trouble quickly against Jaden Ledee, um, so I, that does have me a little bit concerned. So Gaines and Vasquez would probably be the two guys that I would be willing to target this game with. Vasquez is just a bucket getter. Um, in the last two AAC uh, tournament games, he put up 30 and 37 fancy points um, on 7 for 13 and 11 for 13. 13 shooting or 11 for 16 shooting, excuse me. So I would definitely be willing to go with um, Gaines or Vasquez here in this game. Now on the San Diego State side, Jaden Ledee is like their usage monster, right? Like he only has, um, well, I say only, I probably shouldn't use the word only. He has a 30% usage rate on the season, um, which is quite high. Now his fancy performances have been up and down to say the least, but he is still their best player. He is still their usage leader. He is going to get a ton of shots and he's going to draw a ton of fouls. And if UAB can't learn how to defend him without fouling, then he's going to be spending all day at the free throw line. After Ladie, though, there's really just not a whole lot of like great guys to target on San Diego State, unfortunately. Um, you know, there's only other there's no San Diego State Aztec who is over 21% usage on the season other than Jaden Ledee. The closest two are Lamont Butler and, and Reese Waters. Both of them have been um, second or third on the team in usage in the last two games. Lamont Butler is the hero of the NCAA tournament last year, but he's kind of shot dependent. He doesn't get a ton of peripheral stats, and he doesn't always get a ton of shots either, Which so it's not really great to be shot dependent and not get a ton of them. Reese Waters is the USC transfer who is now coming off the bench for them and has had some good performances off the bench, but the fact that he doesn't play, you know, 26 plus minutes does limit his upside. For, um, so I just, it's really a situation where I just don't really want any part of it unless I'm going to play Jaden Lindy. Game number four is Western Kentucky taking on Marquette. So this one is projected to finish as 86 to 72 in favor of Marquette. What's interesting about this one, I did not know this until checking the stats today. Western Kentucky plays at the number one tempo in the nation, according to Ken Palm. And what's really interesting is they don't take a lot of threes. They're at 318th in the nation in three-point rate. We tend to associate modern up-tempo basketball with taking a lot of threes, and Western Kentucky is bucking that trend. Now, what's kind of worrisome, though, is that Western Kentucky is not used to playing top competition. They've only played one one top 100 Ken Palm team this season, and that was against Louisiana Tech, who's in their own conference, and they split that season series. So they have not played anybody near the caliber of Marquette, so we really don't know how they're going to react. What we do know is that Don McHenry, who's only $5,500, is their team leader in minutes, usage rate, shot rate, and fantasy points. He's coming off of a 40 fantasy point performance against UTEP. Now, his outputs have been You know, them trying to pull off this insane upset. He is um, now kind of just the, the second guy on this team in terms of usage. He's going to play a ton of minutes. Um, he's put up 22 fancy points in the last three games. Not a bad option. The other um, guy that puts up a ton of minutes is um, Christian Lander. Um, these are the only guys that um, played 30-plus minutes in the Conference USA Championship game. Um, and Lander put up 27 fancy points in that game on 3-for-11 shooting. So I really do think that that big three of 
Rick Henry, Newman, and Lander are probably the main guys that you're going to want to target. Um, Ter or, uh, Tyrone Marshall, excuse me, Bobacar Faye, and Rodney Howard are their three bigs. They, they kind of rotate with each other. Bobacar Faye is a guy who can put up fancy points in bunches on not a ton of minutes, but not a whole lot of consistency. So the big for Western Kentucky, I would probably only play one of them, but I definitely think that they all have GPP upside. On the Marquette side, the big story here is if Tyra Kolick is going to play or not. If he plays, then I expect him to come in and play about 20 minutes and, and have Marquette make quick work of this game, and he leaves before he's able to put up a ton of fancy points. That's just how I see it. Now, if he doesn't play, what that does, not only does it increase the likelihood that the game stays closer longer, but it increases the usage of Cam Jones, who has been spectacular in the games that Tyra Kolick has missed. Going back the last four games, Col or Cam Jones has been 32, 42, 33, and 50 fantasy points. So he is a really solid option, in my opinion. And even though I think he's a little overpriced at $8,000, his recent production has certainly warranted that price increase. Oso Iguodaro has a Q tag next to him, but I don't think he's questionable. I think he's playing. Um, and so... He's going to be a straight mismatch against this Western Kentucky front court. And if Tyra Kolek is not playing, I think that leads to more shots from Oso. So I definitely do like the upside of Oso Iguodaro as well if Kolek is, in fact, out of this game. If Kolek plays, I don't really think it has that much of an effect on Oso Iguodaro. Sorry for the yawning, y'all. It is getting late at night here, and my six-month-old daughter has, has really struggled sleeping tonight. So I'm trying to make it. Um, now... I do think Marquette has a little bit of a blowout crew. So if you think that they make quick work of this game, um, Chase Ross, Ben Gold, and Trey Norman, um, and maybe even Zay Lowry are going to play boosted minutes in a blowout. And, and all four of them, when they're on the floor, have a decently high usage rate. They're just not on the floor all the time. So I definitely think that if you think this game turns into a blowout, you can play one or maybe even two of those guys as a potential value play and just hope that this game's over at halftime and those guys get a ton of run. With Western Kentucky being first in the nation in tempo, it's not going to take a whole lot of minutes for guys to reach value because they're just going to be more and more possessions. All right, so that does it for the first four games. So let's take a quick little breather, and then we're going to talk about the afternoon slate. All right, so the next game up is going to be Stetson taking on UConn. And if you thought that the Western Kentucky Marquette game was going to be blowout, boy, do I have news for you. This one's going to be even worse. Ken Palm has this one projected to be 86-63 to in favor of UConn. This is the tournament's best offense, number one in offensive efficiency for UConn, versus the 343rd ranked defensive efficiency team in Stetson. So UConn should have very little difficulty scoring the basketball in this game. The question is, is how long are all the starters going to play? Well, for Stetson, the good news is that they should have plenty of incentive to play their starters. The question is, how many points are they actually going to score? This team did play Houston this year, and they only scored 48 points against them. Granted, Houston is a little bit better defensively than UConn, but, but still, that doesn't exactly give a whole lot of encouragement that they're going to be able to keep this game close. Now, Blackman and Swenson both have a 27% usage rate or higher on the season. Both of them average over 4x value for their salaries. I don't think that they're bad values, but I do I do think the matchup's pretty tough, and, and I don't necessarily think it's likely that they're going to put up 50 fantasy points against UConn. However, 16 seeds do score points too. So, you know, if this team is able to get to 65 maybe, um, and they do leave the starters in the whole time, then it's very likely that one of Blackman or Swenson would be able to get value. Now, their primary big is um, Aubin Getaretzi, um, and he, I think, is going to be significantly outmatched going up against Donovan Klingon. However, his, his game log against his own level of competition, he's been very good. Um, but this is a new level of competition. I tend to like playing guards from... Um, these mid-majors more than the bigs, just because there's not a huge size or athleticism disparity at the guard spot um, like there can be at the big position. Um, so I definitely think that Blackman and Spence will be how I would want to target them. Trayton Thompson is the backup big. So if you do think that Gattaretzi could get himself in foul trouble quickly against Donovan Klingon, which is a possibility, then Thompson would be in line for boosted minutes. Now on the UConn side, this is a team that I don't really fear playing guys in a blowout with because they generally play at a slow tempo anyway, and they generally win in blowouts, right? And we kind of know who their starting five is. Tristan Newton is a guy who is going to put up a ton of peripheral stats, and that's how he gets his value. Um, and so he would be probably be the most likely one in a blowout that wouldn't get there because he needs increased possessions to get home. But Donovan Klingon, he doesn't play a whole lot of minutes anyway. And so if you know the game's going to be a blowout and Klingon only plays 25 minutes, well, guess what? He's shown a history of getting to value 
value while playing only 25 minutes. So I don't mind Donovan Quinn at all here on this one. Spencer and Caravan are kind of the wing shooters for this team um, who can do other things as well. They're a little boomer bust, um, so I think they're definitely GPP targets, but they're they're not really guys that I think you can target with any kind of consistency or floor. And then Stefan Castle is the future lottery pick who's very talented, fantasy production, very inconsistent. They're blow up, they do have a blowout crew as well. Hassan Diara is the captain of the blowout crew. You go back and look at his game log, and he plays incredibly well whenever UConn wins their blowout. It's, it's kind of amazing how it works out for him. And then Samson Johnson and Jalen Stewart would also play big-time minutes um, if there were a blowout. And I think Salmon Ball would see a decent amount of run as well. So um, those are some guys you can go with if you think that UConn gets up early and, and wants to conserve some of their legs for the weekend. Next game up is probably... I think one of the most intriguing games around one, New Mexico taking on Clemson. It's projected to be 78 to 76 in favor of New Mexico, according to Ken Palm, which is one of the higher totals on the slate, largely because New Mexico ranks eighth in the nation in tempo. Now, New Mexico is a team that is led by their guards. And everybody who is touting up New Mexico this week as a potential sleeper, I'm one of those people, is probably touting that, you know, guard play is what wins you games in March. And so they have three great ones in House, Dent, and Mashburn. All three of them have a 23% usage rate or higher for the season. And I think you can actually play two of them in the same lineup. In three of the last five games, two of these guards, House, Dent, and Mashburn, have hit 4x value in the same game together. So I do think that there is a possibility that you could play House and Dent or House and Mashburn or um, Dent and Mashburn and have them end up hitting value together. But I don't think there's enough fancy points to go around by playing all three of them. And I do think they're at a very affordable price tag in a very good game environment where they're likely to play a full minute load, which you can't say about a lot of the other top guards on the slate. Now, I do like the matchup for JT Toppin. Um, he's probably going to be going up against Ian Shefflin, who is not the most fleet of foot, and, and Toppin's a pretty solid athlete. Um, and Toppin's also been over 30 fantasy points in, in four straight and six of seven. So definitely a guy I think you can target. Nelly Jr. Joseph is going to be going up against P.J. Hall. So the question is, is who's going to get in foul trouble first? Is it going to be Junior Joseph or is it going to be P.J. Hall? And I don't really feel like I need to make that bet on a 14-game slate where there's going to be a ton of guys that are options. Mustafa Amzil is a backup for New Mexico, but he's a pretty solid scorer and rebounder coming off the bench. He's kind of a defensive liability, but he is a solid scorer, solid rebounder, and does have legitimate upside. He had 25 fantasy points um, against Colorado State in the semifinals of the Mountain West tournament. Now, on the Clemson side, I really like targeting Clemson on normal slates, but I don't think this is a great spot for them. Yes, they are boosted up um, because of New Mexico's fast tempo, but they're really just... I don't know. It's hard to get excited about him on this slate. You know, PJ Hall is the only one on the season with over a 21% usage rate. His fantasy scoring has been just kind of bleh lately, though. Like, he hasn't been above 35 fantasy points in a game since February 10th. That's that's over a month. That's, that's, that's not great for, for a guy who is their best player and their usage leader. Ian Shefflin um, is generally the, the anti-PJ Hall guy. When Hall isn't getting there, Shefflin usually is. But even then, like the last two games have been kind of duds for him, and it's not like they've been great for PJ Hall. So um, I, I don't really know what's up with these two Clemson forwards. Um, John Gerard is the guy who's been playing the best recently. He's had three straight games over 27 fantasy points. He is very shot dependent, though. Um, you know, he has seen a little bit of an uptick in rebounding and assist rate recently, but um, with him being as shot dependent as he is, I really think you're going to need him getting hot from three to hit value here in this game. And then Chase Hunter is another guard that has been very, very up and down recently. I think he's a little overpriced at $5,800 on DraftKings. Jack Clark is a guy who I think is going to need to play a ton of minutes in this game, though. He is their best all-around defender, and boy, they're going to need some defense against these New Mexico guards. I really see the New Mexico guards just kind of run in circles around Clemson, and I think the New Mexico guards really have a lot of success in this one, and it's going to be up to Clemson to see if they can keep up in terms of scoring. Next up, we have Yale taking on Auburn. Um, this one is projected to be 78 to 65 in favor of Auburn. Um, Auburn is a team that plays pretty fast. They rank 58th in the nation in tempo, but it's a huge contrast in styles because Yale ranks 328th in the nation in tempo. Now, the good news for Yale is that they have some legitimate talent, at least with their starters. Danny Wolf is a legitimate seven footer who will probably play in the NBA, in my opinion. Um, and he has legitimate 50 fantasy point upside. Um, three of his last four games, he's been over 38 fantasy points. He is their usage leader on the season. He is a double-double machine. He's not a bad option at 8,300. The, the downside is that he's going to be going up against a monster on the other side. More on that in a second. 
Now, they are a super starting five heavy team, Yale is. So you're going to get big minutes from Mabang, Pulikitis, Noling, and Mahoney. And, and I think that all of them are targetable for that reason in a pace up spot against Auburn. I, I do think that getting a ton of minutes from these guys does make them fantasy viable. Bez Mabang is, in my opinion, their second best player from the three or four Yale games I've watched this year. But the fantasy production isn't always there. He really needs the peripheral stats to get there. But again, if you're playing a pace up game, it's much more likely that he's going to get those peripheral stats. So I don't mind Bez and Bang at $6,600. Um, Pulikitis, John Pulikitis is a designated shooter, and he's been over 24 fantasy points in six straight games, which is pretty impressive. Um, and he's taking double-digit shots in all those games. And so, um, yes, he might be a little shot dependent, but again, if he's going to be playing more possessions, that's got to make you feel like he's going to get more shots. So I don't think he's a bad option either. On the Auburn side, they're – Tough. Like, they're a really good basketball team. I, I will never doubt that with Auburn. But the problem is with Auburn is that they really, really play a lot of guys. And so that makes it really tough to target them in DFS because they're giving so many guys minutes and you just don't really know what you're going to do with those guys, right? Like, I, I just... I don't know. It's it's tough to play a guy when you, when you think that they're only going to be getting like 24 minutes. It, it just is. And so, you know, Broom is great. He's by far their best player. But even then, like he only played 24 minutes in the SEC championship game against Florida. The good news is, is that he only needed 24 minutes to put up 43 fancy points. So if he actually plays 30 plus minutes, he has so much incredible upside. From there, I think that Jalen Williams is probably their second best player. But again, he's a guy that doesn't play a lot of minutes. And, and this Auburn team is just really tough to target for that reason. And I think you can kind of, even though this is a really good spot for him, I think if you're playing cash games, there, there's no security in anybody except Broom. And so you can just cross them off. If you're playing GPPs, you might I want to take a shot at one guy here and there, but even then you're just hoping to get lucky and hope that you're drafting the one guy that's going to end up going off. All right. So that does it for the, um, the afternoon session. Um, so let's go ahead and take a quick breather and then we're going to break down the night sleep. So I could tell that something was missing there because I only did three games, but it, but it took me a second to figure out what it was. I didn't get to talk about the Florida and um, now the Colorado game um, because, you know, they don't have it here on the site on DraftKings yet, but that game would slide in to this afternoon time window. And so it's going to be a big time pace up spot for Colorado going up against Florida. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of value to be had with a lot of the Colorado guys. Um, you know, KJ Simpson is always in play anytime he's on a slate. And I do like that they're now giving a lot of minutes to their starters. So definitely some options. Options there on the Colorado side with Florida, Micah Hanlocked and is out for the tournament with that injury that he suffered last Sunday, which was just brutal. I feel for the guy. Um, that's going to open up a ton of minutes for Alex Condon. And it's going to be really interesting to see if this team gets to play multiple games in this tournament, how the usage ends up um, delegating itself after um, Hanlocked and injury. So let's go ahead now and talk about the night games because now I, I feel like I got my bases covered now. So the first game of the night session is, in my opinion, probably – the most intriguing first round matchup. Um, you know, if it's either Nevada Dayton or Texas A&M Nebraska, in my opinion. Um, and this one is, this one's just good. This is a super contrast of styles. Ken Palm has it projected to be Nebraska 74 to 72 for 146 point total. Texas A&M, is the best offensive rebounding team in the country. They're not a good shooting team, but they rely on getting offensive boards, getting extra possessions, and putting those up and back in to score a lot of points. Nebraska is like the opposite. They are a team who shoots a ton of threes, and they get a ton of assists on those threes. They're like a fantasy point gold mine because of all the assists and the three-pointers. They're, they're getting all bonuses, right? And Texas A&M is a defense that gives up a ton of threes and gives up a high assist rate. So Texas A&M's defense is going to bode well into Nebraska's strengths, but is Nebraska going to be able to get enough rebounds that, to prevent A&M from getting enough shots to just bury them? So it's going to be really interesting to see what actually wins out. For A&M, you do know a few things. Taylor and Radford are going to be taking a ton of shots. You know that. Like, just go back and look at their game logs, and, and they take just an obscene amount of shots to them. I'm absolutely okay with playing either of them for that reason. Solomon Washington has now moved into the starting center role. He had 39 fancy points in their loss to Florida. Um, he is a double-double guy when he gets enough minutes, and right now he is getting the minutes to do so. Manny Obasiki 
I believe that's how you pronounce it, um, has been a revelation ever since he joined the starting lineup. You know, he hasn't taken fewer than nine shots in a game since he joined the starting lineup. And this is a decent pace matchup against Nebraska. He did get a big time price hike up to $6,000, but he's definitely going to be in my player pool again. I've been a big fan of this guy ever since he went into the starting lineup, not just because of the pure fancy point production, but because of the usage. He's getting a ton of shots and he's involved in this offense on a possession by possession basis. So definitely like Manny Obaseki at 6K. Now, on the Nebraska side, you've got a guy who could end up being one of the stars of March Madness, Keizei Tomonaga, a.k.a. the Japanese Curry. And he has started cooking recently. Um, you know, the fancy point totals aren't always there, but he's going to get a ton of shots and Quite frankly, he's usually going to make a ton of shots. And, and if he does, you know, chime in with some peripheral stats, some rebounds and assists, maybe a few steals, that is when he has a lot of fantasy like points like to, to spread around. Like he just he really has the potential to explode for big fantasy point performances, like he did against Indiana for 39, like he did against Michigan for 46. Bryce Williams is a guy I play a lot simply because he puts up a ton of peripheral stats and he doesn't need a high usage rate to put up a lot of fantasy points, which is makes life easier because it just means that KZ can take all the, the shots from the perimeter, right? But he's also improved his three-point shot. He is six for 11 in the last two games, um, put up 38 and 35 fantasy points in those last two games. And I really like Bryce Williams here on this slate. I'm, I'm just going to be honest about it. I think he's one of my favorite plays. He never really gets highly owned. Um, and he's a guy that I'm going to be playing a lot of because of um, the fact that Texas A&M gives up a ton of assists, which both well for him and he's a guy who can help contribute in that rebounding and they're going to need to keep AM off the glass ring mast is their low post scorer he is a really solid option in my opinion he, he hasn't been great from a fancy perspective recently but he's a guy that they'll dump the ball down into and he's another guy like bryce williams that is going to get you a lot of rebounds and a lot of assists because they will run it um their offense through him as a playmaker so i'm um, definitely really like that big three for nebraska and then gary and alec i think are going to be needed to play a lot of minutes to try to again keep up with the rebounding um, and keep this texas a m team off the board because the two of them are really solid rebounders Next up, we have Vermont taking on Duke. Um, Ken Pop has this one projected to be 73 to 62 in favor of Duke. Um, for Vermont, Bogues and Long are their two highest usage players, um, but they really spread the usage and spread the minutes around. It, it really, to me, creates a tougher path for these guys to hit value just because they don't really have games where they play like 37, 38 minutes. Now, what you did see is in the conference tournament for Vermont, Bogues did play over 31 minutes in all three of those games, which gives me a little bit of hope that he's going to be able to do that again against Duke. And that kind of makes him a little bit of a misprice if he's going to play 31 to 35 minutes. TJ Long was not as fortunate in conference tournament play, but he did put up 31 fancy points against Albany in their conference tournament opener on 15 shots. So the upside is definitely there for these top two Vermont guards. Um, Deloney also plays a ton of minutes, but I don't really like his price tag where he's at $6,300. If he were $5,300, I would be all over. Now they do have two forwards who play a ton as well. Um, Elif, or I'm sorry, Illyri, Iofilei, Ileri Iofilei, nailed it. Um, he is $6,200, and um, he has been really good for them recently. Um, 36 and 31 fancy points in his last two games. And then Nick Fiorello at $4,500 is one of my favorite value plays on the slate. He's played over 31 minutes in their last three games, turned it into 14, 24, and 19 points, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but we'll take that at $4,500. And to me, the key to beating Duke is, you need to make Kyle Filipowski defend because he is not a great defender. And so Ayu Filei and Fiorello could be two guys who could certainly take advantage of Filipowski's defense and turn that into a big-time fantasy performance if they're given the opportunity to do so. Speaking of Filipowski, he has been the guy for Duke in the last two games. He has had over a 30% usage rate in both those games, putting up 45 and 54 fantasy points. He put up 18 and 20 shots in both of those games. So if that's going to continue, he's going to be an elite, elite option. And, you know, this is a guy that earlier in the season, we were seeing him in like the 10K range. And then we were seeing him in like the 7K range. And now he's kind of middled out around 8,600. And I think that's a little sweet spot for him that if the usage continues how it's been, he's a very reasonable price tag and should definitely have the ability to hit value at that price tag. Now, what that has caused is with Filipowski eating so much of the usage, the Duke guards have really not been great in the last two games. Jared McCain put up 32 fancy points against USC, but that's the highest fancy point performance by any of the Duke guards in, in the last two games. So Filipowski is going to keep eating up all that usage. I'll be honest, I probably don't want to pair him with anybody else. The good news is with Duke, though, 
is that they played pretty much zero bench. So you're going to get a ton of minutes from Filipowski, McCain, Proctor, Roach, and Mitchell. If this game turns into a blowout, which there's a possibility that it would, Stewart and Power got to be the two guys that I figure would benefit a lot. Caleb Foster is definitely questionable heading into this game. If he does play, he would be a guy who would benefit from a blowout as well. All right, now next up, um, this is where Grambling versus Purdue would stack in. Um, Ken Pop has that one projected to be 82 to 58 in favor of Purdue. It's hard to get super excited about that one because the Grambling guys, um, you know, they kind of had, um, God, what was that guy's name? Kofer. Um, he really came out of nowhere. I don't remember his first name. I know his last name was Kofer. Um, he came out of nowhere at 3, 3K even tonight on the slate um, and absolutely smashed. Um it's TBD whether he's going to be able to do that again, but I, I don't really know how much I can trust these Grambling rotations. And then for Purdue, um, you know, Edie's going to be priced at 11000 and it's going to be really hard for him to get there if he's only playing 24 minutes. It is what it is. All right, now, next game is probably the most intriguing game of the night, in my opinion, from a pure basketball standpoint, not like a matchup standpoint, not like a close game standpoint. I think this one's just going to be fun to watch. It's Charleston versus Alabama. Ken Palm has this one projected to be 93 to 82 in favor of Alabama for a 175 point total, which is the highest team total or the highest game total on the slate. And Bama has the highest team total on the slate. Total. And it's not one of these blowout games. It's For Coastal, or not Coastal, for College of Charleston, with them playing in a fast tempo, they generally play a lot of guys, but they really condense the rotation in conference tournament play, which is what we'd like to see. It gives us a better picture of who to target here on this slate. Rain Smith is a guy who played a ton of minutes and saw a ton of usage in that conference tournament, putting up 30 and 43 fantasy points in their last two games. Ponte Berzovich is their primary big man. Um, the fantasy points can kind of come and go, but you know if he's going to play a ton of minutes, he's definitely going to be an option. The other guy that played a ton of minutes was Kobe Rogers. Um, played 35 minutes in that Commerce Championship game against Stony Brook, put up 26 fantasy points. I don't think he's a bad option either. But after those three, the minute totals for pretty much everybody else is just really uncertain. Burnham and Policelli both have really solid usage rates, really solid rebounding rates, but you never really know how many minutes they're going to play. Um, and the same can kind of be said about Bryce Butler down at $4,500 as well. He's got a really solid usage rate, but you don't really know how many minutes he's going to play. So um, definitely a team that I want to target from the top, and the top isn't even all that expensive. So um, I, I think this is a really solid team to target because think about it, right? Kip Pop has them projected to be 82 slates or has them projected to be 82 points. And how many teams on the slate are projected to score 82 points? It's not a whole lot. So this is a losing team that's projected to score 82. And then their highest price guy is $6,500. So sign me up for getting a few of those guys at the top here for College of Charleston. Now for Alabama, against Florida in their most recent game, eight players played double-digit minutes, and all eight had a 16% usage rate or higher. It's annoying is what it is because it means that they're a really balanced offensive attack, which makes them really hard to target in DFS because you really don't know what's going to happen. Over the course of the whole season, Sears and Estrada have been their two guys, and I've been a guy who's always banged the drum for Aaron Estrada because his rates are really similar to Mark Sears. He's just not always the most efficient, doesn't always play the most minutes because he can't stay out of foul trouble. But now he's only $800 less than Mark Sears. So if you really need that $800, I think you can go down from Sears to Estrada. Estrada will certainly be lower owned. But objectively, Spears has been the better player this year. And so I do think that Spears and Estrada both get a little bit of interest from me. But I don't really see the need to go out of my way to play Estrada when he's not that much cheaper than Spears. Nelson and Pringle um, are the two starting forwards. Um Pringle did start last game with Ryan Griffin coming off the bench. It'll be interesting to see if they continue that. Uh, Pringle was pretty good for my money. I mean, he was 27 fantasy points on 22 minutes. Um, and then the game before that against Arkansas, 35 fantasy points in 36 minutes. So if they keep Pringle in the starting lineup, it's very likely that he's going to continue putting up a lot of success. Um, but I do think it's also a chance that they move Ryland Griffin back into the starting lineup, um, which would certainly hurt Nick Pringle. It'll probably hurt Latrell Wright sell in terms of the minutes that he plays as well. All right, so that does it for the first half of the night session. So let's take a quick breather, and then we're going to talk about the late night session. 
All right, so we've got four games left here in this marathon, and I got to say, if you like what you see here on the channel, if you like what you see here in this video, please help me out. Hit the like button on YouTube and rate and review if you're listening on audio. Um, I promise you guys those help me out a ton. I used to think that um, content creators just ask for that stuff just because they wanted to. No, it really does serve a purpose. It really does help me out a ton. So if you have not already, please hit the like button. Please rate and review. I, I really do appreciate it when you guys do that. And go ahead and subscribe to the channel and subscribe to the audio. That way you can be with us for the rest of March Madness because we're going to have a ton of college basketball content coming your way. All right, now the first game in the late night session is going to be Longwood taking on Houston. And y'all, you don't have to play anybody on Longwood. You don't have to. It's a 14-game slate, so you can just avoid it. Even on the late night slate, it's a four-game slate. You don't have to play anybody on Longwood. They're going up against Houston, who's one of the slowest teams in the nation and one of the best defenses in the nation. This game is projected to be 74 to 55 in favor of Longwood. Now, if you wanted to play anybody off Longwood, um, Wallen Napper is their best player. Um, I've watched them play two games. I can say with, with certainty, he is their best player. He put up 35 fancy points in all three of their conference tournament wins. Um, he's a pretty solid player, but you don't, you don't have to play him against Houston guys. Um, and then they did play a seven man rotation in the big South championship. Um, but the guys that saw the most usage were Christmas, Massey and Zapala. Um, so I would tend to think that those would be the guys who would see the most usage here in this game. Um, Zapala did have a really solid last two games in the Big South Tournament, 30 and 25 fantasy points, but it's highly unlikely that it does that against Houston unless it's just like all in garbage time. So, uh, yeah, not really a situation where you'd have to target y'all. Now, for Houston, we know who they are at this point, right? Jamal Shedd is going to be their lead guy. Um, he's going to carry the offense, and he's going to lead them in usage. He's probably going to lead them in shots, and he's certainly going to lead them in assists. And he kind of needs all of them to be cooking um, for him to reach his ceiling because I think he's a little bit overpriced at $8,300, especially considering this game could turn into a blowout and he could only play 25 minutes. Now, Drew, um, LJ Cryer and Emmanuel Sharp are kind of their wing shooters. Again, if they're only going to play 28 minutes or 25 minutes, it's, it's hard to get super excited about it. Juwan Roberts, though, and Javier Francis are their two bigs, and those are guys who could absolutely put up fancy points in bunches and hit value without playing a ton of minutes. The problem is with Roberts is that he's banged up, and so I don't really see them you know, playing him any more minutes than he has to in this game, which could potentially leave a ton of opportunity to Javier Francis. Um, you know, He did play 30 minutes against Texas Tech when Roberts went out of that game early and put up 32 fancy points. Um, this one is projected to be 77 to 72 in favor of Wisconsin for 149 point total. Now for James Madison, Terrence Edwards Jr. is their best player. He has a 29% usage rate on the season, and that's really good. Um, and you can go back all the way to the start of the season. The one game they played against quality competition against Michigan State, he was able to put up 33 fancy points. So if you can do that against Michigan State, you can probably do that against Wisconsin in my opinion. So I really do like what I've seen out of Terrence Edwards. He gets dual eligibility. He's a very easy click at $7,100. TJ Bickerstaff is kind of their next best player. He's a guy that plays through the post transfer from Boston College, um, and he's put up 30 fantasy points in two of their last five games. Um, so he does have a legitimate ceiling. He doesn't always play the most minutes, though. He does split minutes with Braquan Horton. But he's a guy that they could definitely run their offense through him, and he can definitely have a, a ceiling game. There, there's a chance. I don't, I don't think it's super likely. I would rather play Edwards, but Bickerstaff certainly is play. And then Noah Friedel plays a ton of minutes. Um, and if you're going to play a ton of minutes in, in the NCAA tournament, you're going to have opportunity to put up fantasy points. And at $5,400, he only needs about 22 fantasy points to hit value. The, the only thing is that nobody on this team really has a big time usage rate outside of Edwards or Bickerstaff. They're the only two on the team who are over a 20% usage rate for the season. So I would kind of focus my efforts around getting up to one of those two guys if you want to play somebody on James Madison. Now for Wisconsin, this is another team that we've seen them time and time again. We, we know who they are, right? AJ Store is going to take a ton of shots, and if enough of them go in or if he gets enough peripheral stats, he's going to have a great fancy performance, which he did in the Big Ten tournament. 42, 30, and 38 were his three games in the Big Ten tournament because, again, a ton of shots, enough of them were going in, putting up peripheral stats as well. Check, check, check. That's how he has his ceiling games. Now, what was really interesting for me, 
for Wisconsin in the Big Ten tournament was that they really went away from their bigs, Crow and Wall, and started really playing through their guards, Hepburn and Klesman. Um, Tyler Wall was banged up. Stephen Crow did deal with foul trouble, so maybe there's some reasoning behind it. But Chucky Hepburn and Max Klesman were outstanding in that tournament. Hepburn put up 27, 37, and 39 fantasy points in their three games. And then Max Klesman was just as good, putting up 26, 30, and 25 in those three games. So um, will this usage through their guards continue? I don't know. If you think it does, they're worth playing. If you think it doesn't, then they're certainly stay away options because they're now priced up from what they did in those last three games. Next up, we have TCU taking on Utah State, and this one is going to be 77 to 76 in favor of a TCU. Um, this one is a really um, projected to be a pretty high scoring game. Uh, you know, 153 point total for TCU. They don't have anybody above $6,900. But what's interesting is that they switched up their starting lineup, and I think that if push comes to shove and they're in a close game, they're really going to condense their minutes. Jameer Nelson Jr. is their usage leader on the season, and he runs the one for them. He's not a consistent fantasy performer, but the upside is absolutely there, having games of 29 and 36 in his last five games. And this is a pace up spot, and I, and I think he's going to play a ton of minutes if push comes to shove. Emmanuel Miller is probably their best all around player. Um, he is no stranger to dud games, but he's also no stranger to ceiling games. Um, and so I think that he's a guy that is probably going to be asked to match up with great Osabor on the other side. Um, and so this should be a pretty interesting matchup of athletes between Miller and Osabor. Um, and I do think if Miller's able to stay out of foul trouble, $6,900 is a very reasonable price tag. Now, PV was the other starter, and then Jacoby Coles has kind of been the other guy who's played the most minutes at the center position. Um, so those four um, have kind of been like the big minutes guys. But what's interesting is um, Chuck O'Bannon Jr. moved into the starting lineup for the Big 12 tournament, and he played 27 and 24 put up 15 and 16 fantasy points, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but he's only $4,300. And so if he continues to play this minute load, then he's a guy who can definitely hit value. Not a bad value play in um, cash games or in GPPs, as long as you know he's going to be in the starting lineup, which we might not have that information until close to tip-off, and this is one of the last games on the slate. Now, for Utah State, they also switched up their starting lineup recently. You know, great Osabor and Darius Brown are their two best players, so they didn't go anywhere. Osabor has just been outstanding the entire season. He has a legitimate 60 fantasy point upside. Um, you know, he had a 63 fantasy point performance against Fresno State. I don't think that it's likely he does that against TCU, but the upside is certainly there. Um, and then Darius Brown has a super high assist rate, which is what we like to play against TCU. TCU surrenders a very high assist rate to guards. And so, um, you know, we've kind of made some money this year by targeting guards who get assists against TCU and Darius Brown would just be next in that line. Um, and so I really do like him at $7,700. Now here's how they switched up their starting lineup. Martinez and Fauslev stayed in it. Um, but Isaac Johnson, moved into the starting lineup. He is a big fella. Um, and he played 28 minutes in that game against San Diego State when he moved in, or one day after he moved into the starting lineup. So if he's going to continue to play that many minutes, he is certainly an option. Um, and we have seen bigs do well against this TCU team in Big 12 conference play. So um, I definitely think Isaac Johnson at 4,000 will be an option. Um, and then Jackson and Uduje are going to be the two options off the bench for this team. Um, I really don't think you need to try to, get a, try to get cute and play anybody outside of those seven guys, though. All right, the last game of the night, we've almost finished the marathon, y'all, is Grand Canyon taking on St. Mary's. Ken Palm has this one projected to be 69 to 65 in favor of St. Mary's. And I'll be honest, y'all, St. Mary's is kind of the toughest team for me to figure out. So let's talk about Grand Canyon first. So Grand Canyon has Grant Foster. Who, uh, TGF, they call him. Um, and he is just a really good player. He does a lot of his work in pick and rolls, um, and he's a really athletic wing. I really don't think that um, – I really don't think that St. Mary's has a natural matchup for him now that Jefferson is hurt. Um, and so, you know, you're looking at Grant Foster. He's put up 39, 49, and 42 fantasy points in his last three games. And if you keep it going to five games, there's another 44 and another 39 in there. So he's been great for them down the stretch this season. St. Mary's is definitely going to look to slow this game down. But even if they slow it down, if they don't have anybody who can guard him, he's going to be able to put up a lot of fancy points. Now, the good news is for them also is this is another team who started condensing their rotation and giving their best players boosted minutes in conference tournament play. And for Grand Canyon, it was Ray Harrison um, who has played 31, 38, and 39 minutes in the last three, as well as Gabe McGlothan, who has played 
31 and 35 minutes in the last two. So if those two guys are going to get all the minutes, then those are probably the, the three guys in total that I want to target for this Grand Canyon team because St. Mary's, with them playing such a slow style, you're going to need a lot of minutes if you want to put up fancy points just because those minutes aren't going to feature as many possessions as a normal human basketball game. Now, for St. Mary's, like I said, they're pretty tough to figure out, but they're not going to play a whole lot of bench minutes at all. It's going to be Augustus Marshallonis running point, and you know if St. Mary's is going to put up a ton of points, it's probably going to be because of him. Aiden Mahaney would probably contribute to that a little bit as well. He is kind of like a second point guard. They really do run kind of like a two-point guard scheme with those two guys. Mitchell Saxon is their big. He's a legitimate seven-footer. I don't think that San, or uh, I don't think the Grand Canyon really has a great matchup for him, um, and so if he's able to stay out of foul trouble and stay on the floor, he does have a ton of upside at seventy-three hundred dollars. Alex Duke. Lucas, um, I don't know why they priced him up to $7,400. He, he didn't do really a whole lot in the West Coast Conference tournament to make me think that he deserves to be up there. But ever since Jefferson's injury, he's been a really solid option for this team. Um, I think he's in play, but I do think he's a little bit overpriced. And then Mason Forbes is, is the last starter. Um, played 33 and 35 minutes in their two um, – West Coast Conference tournament games, but the problem is with him being priced at $5,700, um, that's not just territory where you're going to need to just play minutes. You're going to have to actually do things in those minutes, and so it's, it's just a tough target, and so with St. Mary's, I think I would either keep it to Mershalonis, Saxon, or Mahaney for the guys that I would primarily be targeting. All right, so that does it for the Friday, March 22nd slate of College Basketball DFS. Um, Y'all, we are going to be back the whole weekend doing the Saturday slate and the Sunday slate. The plan right now is to do a live Friday night. Um, to talk about the Saturday slate. So if you want to talk about the Saturday slate with me, you want to watch it live, make sure you're subscribed to YouTube so you can get notifications when we go live. I'll also be tweeting out updates for when we're going to go live as well. So make sure you follow me on Twitter so you can get those updates. Um, and then again, if you want more from me, you know, I know this information might be a day old by the time some of you guys are watching it, but I don't see how a whole lot of it's going to change. But if you do want more updated information from me, you've got the Fancy Corner Discord that you can join. The link is in the description. And you've got my Patreon articles that you can get. Um, and you'll get those for the entirety of March Madness. It's, it's a monthly subscription. Um, it's very affordable. It's $3 a month. Um, and so if you want my course for the rest of the March Madness, if you want my lineup strategy for the rest of March Madness, March Madness head on over to patreon.com slash Mike's Money. All right, so that does it for this episode, guys. So, um, you know, pretty much that that's what we got for the Friday slates. Uh, 14 games with with the two kind of bonus games with, with, with a teeny tiny breakdown for both of those two. Um, but that is what we're looking at. And so I'm hoping that I was able to give you guys plenty of information to help you win some money here on this Friday slate. Um, best of luck to you guys on the Thursday slate, the Friday slate, in your bracket pools, whatever, as long as you don't have Colorado State beating Texas, good luck with your bracket. Um, and so um, anyway, that's going to do it for this episode, guys. So um, thank you guys for watching and listening to this point, and I will see you guys next time.